Welcome to the Chess Simple Solution to the Dutch Defense. And before we look at variations and go through what my solution is to the Dutch Defense, I think it's important to provide some context for the Dutch. And in doing so, I wanted to discuss how frequently we as club players are to face the Dutch Defense. And then I also wanted to discuss what Black's ideas are and what they are trying to accomplish when they play the Dutch defense. And we'll look at their main setups that they would play if we were to play a mainline Dutch defense. So on the screen here, I have a few different diagrams. And the diagram on the left shows how frequently we will face the Dutch defense immediately after we play D4. So exactly 2% of the time, after we play d4, black will go straight into the Dutch defense. So that's one time out of 50. When we're playing white, we will face the Dutch straight away. Now there's another way that black will tend to go into the Dutch, and this happens much less frequently. But what can happen is after we play d4, a little less than 10% of the time, black plays e6. And now of those games that comprise about 10% of the time when we play D4, of that 10%, only 3.8% of the time, Black will play F5 on the second move and kind of delay going into the Dutch. And we won't really discuss it, but they're just trying to avoid some anti-Dutch systems for White. Like if they're trying to avoid, like if White would play Bishop to G5, on move two, but if we multiply those two percentages together, basically only 0.37% of the time as white, as club players, will we face somebody that does this where they play e6 and then f5. So that is just roughly one game in 270, in 270 games, only once we will face this delayed um, entry into the Dutch from e6 and f5. So if we add those two percentages together, the 2% where they go straight into it plus the 0.37% where they back, back into it in a delayed way, 2.37% of the time we face the Dutch. And so that's important to just kind of keep that into context, how infrequently we actually play the Dutch. Because that should kind of guide our decision of how much time we actually want to put into preparing for the Dutch. Because as club players, we have all kinds of things that we need to work on. And so another, another little bit of background that I think we should discuss is the ideas and what Black is trying to do when they played the Dutch. So let's take a peek at that. So in the Dutch, there's three main setups that black tends to employ uh, versus main lines. So let's first look at the classical setup, the classical Dutch. And first thing we should probably mention the Dutch in general, what black is trying to do, at least in part, is they're clamping down on e4, trying to make it hard for black to play e4 and, you know, get their central pawns on e4 and d4, basically. So I'm going to quickly kind of zip through just to show one setup that black will employ. And that involves this classical setup here where they have pawns on d6 and e6 and then they develop their bishop to e7. And so what white wants to try to do in this classical dutch is to force through e5, uh, sorry, force through e4. And so they'll have to prepare that a lot of times they'll play rook to e1, knight to c3, they may even play queen to c2 and kind of line everything up on e4 and try to force that through. Now black, of course, they have their own plans and what they want to do is if, if white ever plays d5, they want to be able to meet that by playing e5. And what they want to do is set up this pawn duo on e5 
and D5. And then they have different ideas, but eventually they would like to be able to play this F4 move after they get E5 in, maybe even without having E5 in, but that's called the Dutch Lance. And then they generally want to try to come after us on the king side. And so what they will tend to do, a lot of times they will do they'll, they'll do maneuvers. They may move this bishop dance like this to try to get their bishop traded off for one of white pieces because this is their bad bishop. It's on the same color as this pawn on e5. But a lot of times they'll try to activate it doing this little bishop dance. And then they will also try to get their queen over to the king side here and just come after us. So this is one of three setups that, that black tends to set up. Now the next one is the stone wall. So let's look at that real quickly. In the stone wall, black sets up this formation that looks like a stone wall. It's called the stone wall because it's just kind of hard to break down. Now remember with f5, they're already clamping down on e4. And then in this variation, black doubles down by playing a pawn to d5, further clamping down on e4. And let's just get another move in here. Usually they'll put their bishop on d6 actually. And so there's if you can imagine there's completely different plans in this for black and for white as there are against the classical dutch it's going to be very hard for white to be able to play e4 and so white has to have different plans and on top of that black can play this in different ways so the modern way of playing this so i'm trying to get rid of the paint the modern way of playing this is to play b6 put the bishop here on b7 and then at some point they will play c5 and what might happen sometimes is black will get um, these hanging pawns over here on d5 and c5 but there's different ways that black can do this as well black after they get castled um, we'll just make a random move for white here they can also employ this bishop dance Sorry. Where they get their light squared bishop outside. And then they they can play their queen also um, over. And they'll try to attack us on the king side. Just like they do in the classical Dutch. So there's a couple different plans in that system. And then to make matters even worse. There's yet another setup that black will do. And that's called the Leningrad Dutch. And in the Leningrad Dutch, black plays this quick g6 move. And they're going to fianchetto on the king side. And we end up getting a position kind of like this. Now, there's different ways to play this for black as well. Um, a common thing that they may do is move their queen to e8 and just try to physically ram through e5. And I guess the thing to say about this Leningrad Dutch is that it is extremely sharp. The black players tend to be extremely sharp. And um, you better really know your stuff if you're going to go into this as white. So that's just a little bit of a background on what these different setups are for the Dutch. But the important point is to see just how much we need to know, how many different plans we need to be prepared to meet if we kind of let black set up their pieces in one of these ways. And so let's just just glance again real quickly at those percentages because it's important to use this as we come up with our plan of how we are going to attack the Dutch. So in my mind as an adult improver, when I look at how infrequently we face this Dutch defense basically one game out of 50 when we play white. Coupled with the fact that there are multiple setups for black, each with different multiple different plans, it doesn't make a lot of sense in my mind to prepare in depth for every different setup that, that
that black can throw at us. What I th think would be optimal is if there is one thing that we could do that disrupts black from employing those different setups, those multiple different setups, and is still sound for white. And lo and behold, there is. And that's what I'm going to show you. That's what I'm going to look at here next. And in my mind, I'm going to take it as one step further. And I'm not even going to worry about this possibility that comes up basically one in 270 games. I think you'd be better off studying practically anything else and just winging it if this scenario comes up. So I'm going to focus on this scenario that will come up about 2% of the time. And so let's just take a look at that here. So the solution I came across for adult club players with limited time and competing priorities was to play this Raphael variation. And what the Raphael variation is, is basically saying, okay, black wants to, black wants to prevent me from playing e4. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play knight to c3 right away. And I'm just going to give black the one finger salute and say, you stop me from playing e4. And what's interesting, we'll look at some uh, facts about this Raphael variation. And then we will actually go through some variations and look at it. So some facts on this. This Raphael variation is only the fifth most common move for white after black plays f5. But interestingly, at the club level, it scores better than any of the main responses for white. So it scores better than playing c4. It scores better than playing bishop to f4, knight to f3. All the main responses, it actually scores better. It has a 51% score for white versus a 45% score for black. And that's a that's 2 to 3% higher uh, score than it is for these main lines. And part of that reason is that you know white trying to navigate all these different plans that black can do these three different setups with different plans in each one and black can become an expert in these things and so the beauty of this Raphael setup is that we take them out of their preparation you know they may, maybe they do have something prepared for this but at least it's not going to have the same plans that they use all the time if they play the stonewall all the time or the classical setup or the leningrad all the time at least we're going to mix things up on them and so they're going to have to face something different now let's let's look real quickly too and just kind of examine what black tends to do when they are faced with this Raphael variation and as we can see 72% of the time, they just simply play knight, knight to f6. And so that will be the first thing that we'll look at because that's what you'll face the vast majority of the time. Then after that, 12% of the time, they just play e6. It basically just let us ram e4 in right away. So obviously that's great for us. And then only 5.6% of the time do they actually play... Um, d5 and do something about stopping us playing e4 and as we note here um this would only be like one game in 900 that we would actually have this come up as white so it's up to you whether you want to actually prepare anything for that or just wing it but i will show in kind of an easy idea as london players that we can use against that which is actually pretty good. So that being said, I think we should start looking at the variations now. And we'll start by looking at um, knight to f6 by black because that's what we're going to face the majority of the time anyway. All right, so let's start looking at some actual variations and discuss it as we go. So as we said, we're going to play knight to c3. Whoops, hang on. Helps if we play the Dutch. We're going to play knight to c3. Black's trying to clamp down on e4. So we play knight to c3 saying we're going to support e4. 
We're giving you the one finger salute. And what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to stop us from playing E4? And as we saw when we looked at those percentages, it is only 5% of the time that they'll play D5 here. The vast majority of the time they play Knight to F6. And one thing to notice is that if we can force them to take our E pawn once we get it to E4 with their F pawn, then this E pawn is going to be you know, weak and backwards. And to boot, they have this weakness on this h5 to e8 diagonal. So we can use that as well. And so what we are going to do is we're going to play bishop to g5. Because this knight is helping control, F, it's helping control e4. So we're going to attack that knight so that we can try to just ram that pawn through. And so... The vast majority of the time, what black will play here is e6. And now you can see that knight no longer has control over this e4 square. So all we're going to do is just bam, pop through e4. So like every move so far has made sense for what we've done. We're just trying to hammer through e4. And... We have this open di diagonal here. So, you know, these light squares around the king are already um, weak. So, at some point we want, to, we want to exploit that. Now, as we can see, the most common move here is pawn takes pawn. And so we've kind of accomplished our goal here we forced in e we forced in e4 we made them react to it and now i'm just kind of playing the the main moves here we have a really cool idea we're going to do bishop takes knight basically forcing bishop takes bishop and then now we're going to use the consequences of this f five move earlier opening this diagonal and setting up this check and so black all but has to play g6 here but now in addition to having weak light squares around the king now there's weak dark squares around the king and so we are going to play queen to h6 we're going to prevent castling we're gonna, we got weak squares around uh, dark squares that are weak around the king as well now so what our plan is, is we're going to castle queenside. We're going to develop our minor pieces as quickly as possible. We're going to get our knight to f3. We're going to get our bishop out to d3, which will attack these light squares around the king. And um, then we're just going to start hammering h4, h5, and we're just going to ask black what they're going to do about it. Um... So this is, you know, really strong for for white, obviously. And one thing I wanted to point out is that if black gets greedy and grabs that free pawn, it's not actually free. We're actually basically winning here. But we just continue about our plan, and black doesn't really have anything better than just running back, and we can just start playing h4. And just, uh, we have this lead in development. Our pieces are better. So we're just going to get going, start attacking um, these weaknesses around the king. And so that's actually a pretty easy one to play out. So we'll look at some other variations here. So we just looked at what happens if black tries to be greedy and grabs the d4 pawn. That's obviously bad for them they don't have time to be doing stuff like that since they're already behind in development and their pieces are not placed as well as ours so the most common move is actually to play queen to e7 and in that case we just take the bishop and we continue on with our plan of just castling queenside and then developing our pieces quickly and one thing i wanted to just point out um, 
you know, the most common moves would be just, we just develop and we get, you know, get our bishop out to d3 and just continue about our attack. But one thing to note is that this f2 pawn here is actually invulnerable because if black were to try to do something like that, we just trap that queen in there basically. We're just going to play rook to d2 on the next move. So something like this and the rook is trapped. So that's just worth noting. Um, so let's back up a little bit in the variation and uh, start from the beginning and just look at other possibilities. So let's look at, let's say... after e4 instead of taking let's say they do bishop to e7 well in that case we can just take on on f5 and we just do something as simple as this just taking over that diagonal now they got two different now they got two weak light square diagonals so that's obviously terrible for black so let's go back to the beginning So let's look at what happens if, instead of playing knight to f6, let's look at what happens if they play e6 right away. Well, in that case, they're not preventing us from playing e4, so we're just going to play e4 right away. Um, and then if they take, we've already kind of won the battle, and it will more than likely just transpose back into the same position right here. So we know we take with the bishop here, and then we're going to go hit them on this diagonal. And so now we're back into this, this same thing where we jump on h6, the same line as before. So, I mean, that uh, as we looked when we had those slides up, between this move and this move, that covers 85% of the time. And obviously if they don't take here, we're right back into it. We've transposed back into it. So we don't need to know very much. And that's kind of my point, I think, for us adult improvers is put our time where it's going to make a difference. You know, if one game out of a thousand, you know, we run into something, well, whatever. But we're covered for 85% of the time for something that we face 2% of the time. And so I think that, to be honest, this is all a person would need to know at the club level, especially for an adult improver, is just know we're going to play knight to c3, ram through, ram through e4, pin the knight to take away the indirect pressure on e4. Remember that this diagonal is weak and we're going to use that. When they play g6, we move our queen up, and then we have an, then we got weak dark squares as well as light squares. And at that point, all we need to know is we're going to just castle queenside, develop our pieces as quickly as possible. Knight to f3, bishop to, bishop to uh, d3, barreling down on these new weaknesses of these two pawns that are on light squares without adequate protection. And it's just, uh, just kind of a dream for us, actually. So... I think for most people that's enough, um, but I think what we'll do is let's just look quickly at what happens if black actually plays d5 and prevents us from hammering e4 through like we were able to in these lines. All right, so we'll look at this one chance out of 900 when uh, black actually does something about uh, to try to stop us from ramming through e4. And so if they play d5 here to clamp down on e4, what we'll do is we'll play bishop to f4. That's the beauty of the London system is we can use this thing against practically anything if need be. And let's look first because this occurs so infrequently, we're just going to look at uh, the two most common responses for black here. 
So let's actually start out with knight to f6. And what we're going to do um, in both cases, actually, whether they play knight to f6 or e6, the two most common responses, we're going to play knight to b5. We're going to do this Jobava London style convergence on c7. And basically, we're going to uh, more or less try to force them to play knight to a6. And we're just going to um, move the knight away from its naturally um, most advantageous developing squares. And so we're going to play e3. Now, black will likely kick us away with c6. And that's fine because we've, we've accomplished our goal. We, we got that knight uh, over on the edge of the board. And um, let's say uh, black tries to correct the position of his knight. What we're going to do is we're just going to rush for that e5 square with our knight. Because now this knight is on c7 instead of being able to develop to either c6 or d7 and contest this knight. So that knight is just going to kind of be sitting there unless he wants to give up his bishop for it or unless he wants to use his kingside knight to try to get rid of it, in which case he would give up protection of this diagonal. So we can see we kind of uh, we gained a, you know, a bit of a victory there. And let's say, um, you know, after he kicks us back, let's say instead of knight to c7, if he went e6, well, we would just kind of continue along the same lines. We can do a position like this where after these exchanges, this knight's a beast, right? Hitting this, converging on that. If this comes away, we have something like this. So we get good positions uh, just setting up this kind of London here and then playing knight to b5. And we would use the same idea if instead of knight to f6 here, which we just looked at, if they did e6, we would do the same thing, converging on c7 again, threatening to go there and fork. So once again, basically they're more than likely going to play knight to a6, either that or they could do bishop to d6 and we would just do knight takes bishop, and that would be good for us. So same kind of thing going on here. Once again, we just rush in to that e5 hole, and it's not easy for this queenside knight um, to contest it now that we've uh, driven it to the edge of the board and made it come back. So there you have it. That's the just simple solution to the Dutch defense. There's very little that we need to know to be covered the vast majority of the time. And so I think as adult improvers, it's uh, important for us to allocate our time efficiently and effectively, realizing that if we're club, play, club level players and we're adult improvers, there's so many things that are a better use of our time um, than preparing every possible opening line against every scenario. Like in this case in the Dutch, you know, letting them set up one of their standard setups and having to try to battle our way through the Leningrad Dutch. I think the other thing worth mentioning is that, you know, this is like uh, far down on the list of things pre to prepare uh, against for the Dutch players too. I, uh, I came up with this idea because earlier this week I played um, a game against a, a player rated 2330 in classical and I looked and he was like 2380 in rapid and he played the Dutch against me and you know, I didn't really have much prepared for the Dutch yet. Um, I was following Alex Banzia's advice in his chessable course to prepare, you know, for the more common things like the Chigorin and stuff like the England Gambit and then more of like the copycat and mainline things in the London um, than preparing against all these rare things right away. And so I just I just played this Knight to C3 thing and I just completely won it and I ended up actually holding a draw against this guy and um what i found interesting is a player of that strength he didn't he didn't play it optimally he didn't have a plan against this um so even me not having a plan i i was much better off i never would have gotten a draw against him going into one of these mainline things and i i don't know what i don't know what system he plays whether 
you know, but, you know, I can imagine playing a guy that strength uh, in the Leningrad Dutch, I would have got just completely hammered. So that's all I'm going to study, um, you know, for, for quite a long time in the Dutch, and I'm just going to learn it as I go. And maybe one additional suggestion would be to just um, look at, pull up some games in the database in these lines and just look for games where a stronger player has white against a lower rated player with black and just look at the plans that they use and the resources they find uh, within these lines. But the beauty is, is there's not much to memorize. It's more just ideas based. And um, we covered that and uh, I think we're good to go on the Dutch. So good luck with that. I hope you found it useful. Take care.